Yeah. So within lumber, lumber. you know, you have hundreds of items that right. are quote unquote commodity lumber. They all move differently. Welcome to the Smarter Building Materials Marketing Podcast, helping you find better ways to grow leads, sales, and outperform your competition. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Smarter Building Materials Marketing, where we believe your online presence should be your best salesperson. I'm Beth Popnikolov, your host, and today we are revisiting lumber prices because we know we haven't gotten enough of what is happening with that world. So we're excited to bring on a couple of the team members from Sherwood Lumber. In the studio with me, I have Steve Loebner. He's the VP of Commodities and Risk Management. I also have Josh Goodman. He's the SVP of Force Products, Sales, and Supply Chain for Sherwood Lumber. Guys, thanks so much for your time and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So before we dive in to the volatility of the lumber pricing market, why don't you guys take just a few seconds and introduce yourselves and introduce Sherwood Lumber for our listeners. Well, thanks again for having us, Beth. Um, so just a, a high level about Sherwood Lumber. Um, we are a family owned business, third generation coming into our 70 years in business. I am in third generation family member. We have about 20 distribution centers around the country. Um, our largest facility is in Palmer, Massachusetts, which is around 70 acres. And uh, that is solely owned by Sherwood Lumber. Um, we have about 40 lumber panel uh, traders. Um, our three main office locations, Portland, Oregon, Melville, New York, and Tampa, Florida, uh, and then we have um, remote offices around the country. Just ninety percent of our business is focused on commodity sticks and lumber and panels. Um, a big focus that we've been uh, growing over the past couple of years has been the specialty business, and that's mainly in the Northeast, and that is solely focused on exterior building products. So anything you see outside of your house from siding to decking to railing, we're in it. So that's a little bit about Sherwood Lumber, um, about me. I just quickly said I'm a third generation family member. I've been in, I've been here at Sherwood for now uh, roughly about 13 years. And once I came into the business after graduating Syracuse University with a finance and accounting degree, I really started from the ground up uh, unloading rail cars, loading trucks, then moved into the office with uh, our CFO doing the accounting skills that I really practiced in school, and then uh, did logistics work, worked on a lot of uh, marketing and IT, implemented a whole new computer system. And so that was the whole back end of the business. And since 2017, I focused on the front end, so on the buying and selling. And that's where I sit right now, managing all the buyers and the inventory around the country alongside uh, sales and working hand in hand with Mr. Steve Loebner. It's a great segue. Steve, what about you? Why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Okay. Um, I've been in the industry about 20 years. Uh, my background prior to that is a little bit unique for, the, for this industry. I was an options floor trader stock options that traded um, in San Francisco, the Pacific Stock Exchange, and then later on at the Chicago Board Options Exchange in Chicago. Uh, so my background's in financial derivatives, which has been sort of a, a great segue into, into my current role here, which is managing you know, risk management forward pricing, which is a, you know, something Sherwood Lumber is known for. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Um, we have a, a sales office here with 10 traders. So I run that. Um, you know, we focus, as Josh mentioned, on um, just commodity lumber panels, uh, two by fours, two by sixes. We don't really get too involved in the specialty side of things out here. You know, so so our day to day is basically talking to the sawmills across, across North, North America, America, selling and talking to customers, buying and selling for um, for our inventory, out of our inventory, um, doing direct trading and and managing the features. So that's kind of what I do. So before we get into talking about lumber prices, because you both, you know, you've leaned really hard and transparently into, you know, we're into commodity selling, you know, we are into sticks and lumber. And that's something that comes up quite a lot in our conversations with manufacturers and dealers is the fact that a lot of the products, maybe even the majority of the products 
in the building space are technically commodities. And Steve and I were chatting before the podcast and just talking about some of the unique ways that Sherwood Lumber goes to market and some of your unique business models. I'd love to know how you're differentiating in a commodities market that's not just a race to the bottom. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, Josh, I can probably take this one, but I know that um, our owner, Andy, he always says that we try to take the commodity out of the commodity, you know, um, so it's not a race to the bottom. If you're solely competing on price, you, you know, ultimately you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be in business that long. So we right. don't do other things. Um, <laughs> Josh, you want to you want to kind of kick that off in terms of what we do from a distribution standpoint? Yeah, like Steve mentions, you know, we try to take the commodity out of the commodity and we're trying to provide the, you know, the ultimate best service for our clients uh, day in and day out. So what we're doing is bringing in bulk material and we're facilitating from the logistics standpoint, from the credit standpoint to servicing the customer either directly to their yards, directly to specific job sites, to um, um, just making it as easy as possible from uh, a mixed truckload, you know, specification versus in large quantities and really delivering exactly what they need when they need it and provide if it's credit, um, you know, that's what we do. I would add that provide sort of a, a myriad of, of different um, services that our customers can use. So it's anywhere from the, from the mixed truck, small quantity distribution um, customer that might be a, a smaller, you know, independent guy in a, in a big city that has tight space to we're also dealing with the largest, um, you know, dealers in the country that have, you know, 100 acre, you know, yards where they can store 300 cars. Um, so they can, so customers can come to us for the small mixed loads, they can come to us for their bulk shipment needs. And also where we really, um, I think, differentiate ourselves is in the risk management, the features, long-term pricing space, um, where we're essentially providing customized risk management solutions for um, customers all around the country to um, help them mitigate their market risk through all these crazy you know, ups and downs that we've experienced, certainly the last couple of years. It makes a ton of sense. When you think about, you know, where your product fits and then what are the pain points kind of on either one of those ends and the way that you're differentiating yourself is solving, not just for, Hey, we have pro like need product, have product, but what's leading up to that product point, making sure that they're getting the right product and then getting it all the way through to the job site. I think that's, I mean, that's a huge differentiator for sure. And solves a lot of the frustrations and kind of complications that we know exist within our, within our industry. So I, I love that. And Steve, you, you started to mention, you know, about some of your risk management and futures. So I'm going to loop us back around to our original conversation as we were tying up 2022 lumber prices, we're starting to get back close to pre pandemic prices where we were at least getting within the realm of normalcy. We've started to see a small uptick in January and February. I think a small considering trend as we go into March, I'd love to hear from your perspective what you think is contributing to that and where you all are anticipating lumber prices going this year. I know that's a bit, that's a big ask, right? Cause there's still, there's eight months left. So if right. we need to scrap the whole episode, cause we just all missed it. That's, I have no problem doing that. <laughs> just kidding. No, it's been wild. And you know, the old adage is like, if you don't like the weather, just wait a week and it'll yeah. be something different. So I think you could really say the same thing about lumber pricing the past, you know, year. It's just been all, just wild. So we, we came off the extreme highs as to your point, we sold off to some sort of pre-pandemic normal, quote, normal levels. Um, we've had a, a very, we had a, a large rally about three to four weeks ago, followed by an epic collapse. Now we're starting to climb out of that. But I think when you, when you kind of step back from all that, I think what we're doing is we're trying to figure out a new kind of long-term sustainable range for, for lumber. And our feeling is that that range is probably higher than the, you know, pre-pandemic normal. Uh, input costs, um, log supply in Canada. There's a lot of things that have changed and evolved over the past few years. So we think lumber should be higher than, than what it used to be. Um, but we certainly don't expect to return to the, the, the crazy days of, you know, two years ago when, when a car lumber was a quarter million dollars for a car two by four. See, we don't think that's going to happen. But um, so I think we're in the early, we're in the <clears throat> middle stages of that process of fleshing out like what, new, what reality is and what and a sustainable level is. 
um, which most likely, if I had to guess, is probably going to be, you know, 50% plus over kind of the old historic ranges, which is sort of where we're at right now, mm -hmm. give or take, depending on the item. So you're expecting we're going to even out kind of about where we are, give or take. Just now today, we're starting, we're starting to rally again over the past few days after, a, a, you know, a pretty epic sell-off. Um, so I think, you know, we're probably going to be higher than we are right now. Yep. Um, but I wouldn't say, like, we're not going to be double, you know. Uh, futures right now are in the low fours. I, I, would, I would expect a realistic range for futures, maybe 400 to 600, if I had to, you know, if I had to just make a guess. And that, it'll, there'll certainly be volatility around that, but that's kind of our feeling for kind of long-term sustainable, where the mills are able to make a little money, the, the customers are happy, you know, we're at a, yeah. a good middle ground that makes sense. There'll be a lot of ups and downs in, in the, between all that, though. One other point to add is, you know, this extreme volatility over the past, you know, it's been past couple of years, but I think right now, as we've seen housing starts um, come off over the past, you know, six to nine months, and it's stabilizing here, right now we're in the process of right-sizing the supply side. Mm -hmm. And that's just only a matter of time to right size what we've heard and seen over the past 30, 60, 90, 120 days between um, permanent shutdowns, curtailments, reduced shifts. So how that all affects and, you know, what is brought into the marketplace to the current, you know, right sizing the, the supply to the demand. And, uh, you know, that's that's where we're at right now. We recently saw like some Q4 earnings announcements from some of the large Canadian mills. And um, they, they were, you know, these guys were losing quite a bit of money. And this is oh, based yeah. on, but this is based on the Q4 pricing, which was higher than where we are right now. And, and these are at levels, mind you, that are, you know, fairly high relative to price levels, fairly high relative to historical norms, and they're still losing yeah. a lot of money. So, you know, log costs might adjust. You know, there's going to be some fluctuation in that, but basically, lumber prices have to be higher than they used to be in order to be sustainable. So. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's what we're hearing from categories across the board, right? <clears throat> For some, it was deceptively low, maybe even lower than it should have been. So we're just seeing everything kind of come up across the board. Nobody loves that just building a house costs more. Builders don't love it. Homeowners don't love it, but it's, it doesn't seem to be like there's a significant reduction other than places where it was significantly inflated, like lumber was in, you know, 2020, right. 2021. I mean, that makes a ton of sense. As you're talking to your customers about lumber futures and the lumber futures market and risk management, what are some leading indicators you're monitoring from your side that you're, you know, either pushing to them or raising flags for them in those conversations? Each customer based on the business segment that they're in has a, its own, they have their own unique like risk profile. So I think um, those conversations really are sort of tailored to, to the, you know, is it a sawmill, you know, where their risk is to the downside? Is it a multifamily developer where their risk is to the upside? So what we try to do is, you know, first and foremost, just get an analysis of, of where they sit in the space and what their risks truly are. And, and from that, we help them craft a risk management solution um, to, to mitigate what their risks are. Um, and that could be futures, it could be uh, fixed pricing, future physical delivery. It could be financial swaps. There's a lot of different things we do, but they're all really custom tailored to um, the profile of the folks we're talking to. And so I guess the indicators we would look at would be based on, you know, case by case of what's going on. Of course, you know, we're now, we're in the futures market very heavily timing things and, and um, a lot of technical sort of data we can look at to help us in terms of when to implement trades. <coughs> but big picture, it, it's really, it's about it, it helping customers initiate the proper long-term plan to, you know, to smooth out their, their earnings volatility. As you're looking at, you know, the back end and the data that you need to have in order to be able to create these risk management profiles or risk management statuses for your customers, is there a topic or a category or something that you are seeing or that you find yourself elevating in conversations that maybe isn't quite on the radar for everyone the way that you would think that it should be? I would say, you know, just kind of based on my background in the financial markets that I would say risk management and futures in general in the lumber industry is dramatically underutilized. Mm. Um, I'm always just sort of shocked and, and blown away by the amount of risk that a lot of entities are willing to take when there's a perfect product that is sits that, that's available to help mitigate that. So I, I you know, um, I just think it's a space that um, everyone in lumber talks about futures, they watch mm -hmm. futures, but there's, mm -hmm. I would say the actual percentage of 
market participants that are heavily involved in, a, in sort of risk management is very, very low. And, um, and so I guess my overall comment would just be that and that it's underutilized and that it's not. And I, I would say that the industry could probably benefit from a little more sophistication in terms of utilizing some of these tools that are available. Josh, do you have any, any thoughts? I miss anything? No, I think you hit a nail on. I think, uh, you know, what you discussed earlier was, you know, the range, you know, of let's just say 400 to 600. And you know, when you're talking to various different customers is understanding, you know, where the risk is at, where it lies. And if we're at the bottom end, we would, you know, suggest obviously to cover up as much as you possibly can. And at the higher end of the range is, you know, what, you know, the comfort for each customer is different of how much risk they want to take. But, you know, that's definitely something to look at. And then another tool that we use that is probably not well used in the industry is just looking at specific items as far as what's undervalued and what's overvalued to the mm. current market of the data that we have for the past, I don't know, what is it, Steve, 30 years? Yeah. So within lumber, lumber. you know, you have hundreds of items that right. are quote unquote commodity lumber, they all move differently. And so, you know, like what Josh is, you know, mentioning is sometimes some of these items might be dramatically, they might be very cheap relative to historicals, relative to everything else. And that might be right. an item where we would advise our customers to, hey, buy six months worth of this stuff. There might be something else that's, you know, extremely high relative to its normal relationship. And these things tend to come back in line over time. So um, that's analysis that, that's pretty instrumental in, in not only guiding our customers, but certainly in guiding our inventory purchase decisions and how we run our own business as well. I love that. I think that's a great point also is just the variation and the specifics within even just lumber futures and lumber pricing in itself and understanding where's their risk, where's their overvalue. That's a really great highlight, Josh. I appreciate that. I want to go back, Steve, to your comment of really just your the amount of like your surprise that utilizing something like this risk management service isn't more common in the industry. Is there a particular obstacle that you think stands in the way? Maybe it's just awareness, <laughs> but if it's well, not, if it's not awareness, you know, what's the conversation that you find you have to have or the, the aha moment you have to create? I think there's a few things. Um, you know, a lot of companies have done it the way they've done it for a very long time. And they've had a lot of ups and down volatility along the way, but in the end of the day, they've made money. So it's like, why would I, you know, why would I change if what I'm doing is working? Right. It's like, okay. I mean, if you want to make you know, lose 60% in one year and, you know, so I don't know, but, but that's one obstacle. The other, I think is just the, um, you know, specifically with the futures market, I think it scares people. I think the financial, um, you know, the ups and downs and, and the, the, the cash flow and margin implications that, that come along with that, that are inherent with futures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is something that, that a lot of people do shy away from because those swings can be pretty significant. Um, and people tend to look at, you know, one of the things that we're good at at Sherwood is we have a very large futures position, but we also have a very large cash position. And we look together how that marries together for your total p mm &hmm. versus a lot of people view them separately. Like they're two separate things. It's like, no, you put these things together. So a lot of people have a hard time making that mental jump. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that the folks that the folks that do recognize the value, you know, to be gained from risk management that, that partner with us, these are people that are with us day after day, week after week, you know, year after year. Um, and so once they sort of get it and they initiate that into their business and they recognize that, you know, particularly in these volatile times, you know, reducing that, that, that earnings fluctuation is so valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, a consistent return of 15% is better than this crazy up 50 oh, down, yeah. you know, so, um, so it, it's very powerful once people kind of buy into it and we help them navigate how to do it. Before I let you go, I've got one question. We're asking a lot of our guests as we're at the beginning of the year, other than lumber futures and lumber pricing, what's one prediction you have for the building material sector in 2023? What are you expecting to see? I mean, I've been saying it all along with my customers. I think it's pretty obvious. It's uh, coming into 2023. It was doom and gloom, recession, depression. It is well better than expected business. Um, uh, things are shipping out quicker than you know expected. So I think just a better than expected than what you know we thought coming into this year. I love it. Steve, what about you? 
I would say the same thing. I mean, I think the, the multifamily space is extremely busy, super robust. I mean, we're record shipments and record, not near record uh, backlog of orders. So that's that part is strong. Single family, it's challenged, but there's also, you know, the supply, Josh mentioned supply, lumber supply earlier. Well, there's also like housing supply. It's not that high. Mm-hmm. And this stuff is going to work itself out quicker than people think. And so I think people could be surprised. It could be um, better than expected. People don't want to get too uh, down the dumps here, in my opinion. That's so that's so interesting. That's both of your responses. So when we were at the builder show at the end of January, we often we always get asked, you know, what are people saying about the economy or what do you think is going to happen? And without fail, every single conversation I had or have had over the last four months has been exactly this where whoever I'm talking to, whether it's a manufacturer or a dealer, their response is basically like, I know that I'm supposed to be worried and I know that things are supposed to be bad and maybe they're bad for everybody else, but for us, we seem to be doing really well. And it's not all eggs in that basket and we're all a bit more cautious these days, just naturally coming out of everything that's gone on and all of the volatility and change and unexpected change that we've gone through the last three years. I don't think anybody's saying it in a presumptuous or prideful, like we've hacked it kind of way, but just in the, like, is it okay that I'm okay? Cause like, we're okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just love hearing that. Cause I think that's been the, the con the consistent cadence is like cautious optimism, but with reason to yeah. be optimistic. I think that's well said. Yeah. yeah. I love I it. I think cautious optimistic is exactly where we stand, but you know, it's like Steve always mentioned it, business isn't going to come as easy as it did the past two years. It's yeah, going to be 100%. harder to conduct, but there's plenty of business out there. hundred percent. Is there anything that you all have had to pivot or find yourself doing as a result as you know, 2023 business, isn't going to be as easy to come by as it was the last two years, any specific strategies you've put into place to continue to see demand walk through the door? I think just leaning on our overall value proposition that we sort of alluded to earlier in in the Mm -hmm. podcast, um, just really, you know, we have to provide value to our customers, you know, otherwise there's no reason for us to be here. So between the just-in-time deliveries and just all the different business models that we run, we just have to, I mean, that's where we're going to find our success. Um, It's not like shooting fish in a barrel anymore. I mean, the markets, we're back to normal. We're going to have to work for it. But um, I think, you know, I think there's a lot out there. And I think, you know, the folks that navigate that well are going to do just fine, frankly. Not shooting fish in the barrel, but also not smoke and mirrors. I love that. We're just going to deliver value. Yeah. I mean, what else is there? Nailed it. That's awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your time. If any of our listeners want to get in touch or ask more questions after the episode, what'd be a good way for them to get in contact with you? Our email addresses, uh, josh at sherwoodlumber.com and slobner at sherwoodlumber.com. Yeah. Great. We'll make sure to link those in the show notes. Thank you both again for your time. This has been awesome for our listeners. If you want more great content like this, head to venvio.com slash podcast to subscribe until next time. I'm Beth Pavnikolov. Thanks. 